So in this video, I'm going to be talking about function orthogonality. Function orthogonality. And you might say, what on earth is this weird sounding abstract mathematical term? And why, why would we care about using it? Um, well, the answer is that equations like Schrodinger's equation, uh, which we're going to be dealing with a lot in the following videos, uh, and we can just write the time independent equation here, uh, but also equations like Maxwell's equations uh, and other partial differential equations that show up all over the place in engineering and mathematics. Uh, so other partial differential equations. These are often absurdly difficult uh, to attack front on. So we don't just want to attack them uh, directly. We don't want to try and find a solution. Often we just want to use properties of the solutions without knowing anything about what the actual solutions are. So for example, without knowing anything about what psi of x actually is, the wave function, um, we can use properties uh, of that wave function that are due to the underlying equation that make our lives much, much easier and uh, make a lot of otherwise uh, impossible problems possible. And I would argue that function orthogonality, uh, this guy right here, is probably the most powerful um, of all properties uh, in, in mathematics that we use to attack differential equations like the Schrodinger equation, Maxwell's equations, and, and others. It's actually one of the things that underlies uh, things like the Fourier series uh, and the transform, as well as things like polynomials. Um, this, uh, this concept, function orthogonality, is what gives these constructs their power. And so in this video, I'm going to be describing just what it is, what do we mean when we say function orthogonality, uh, how do we test for it, um, and how do we use it. So if you've taken linear algebra, and I hope you have at this point, uh, because it'll make this make this video considerably easier, um, we know that vectors can be orthogonal. So we can take, uh, and we can test for that orthogonality by taking the dot product. So let's say we've got some vector a, which we can represent as a column vector as one, zero, and b, which is some vector, uh, say, zero, five, for example. And if we take their dot product, we know this is just the pointwise multiple element multiplication. So uh, one times zero plus zero times five, and this is equal to zero. So these two functions are orthogonal. So anytime the dot product is zero, anytime the dot product of two vectors is zero, this means the functions are orthogonal. Or sorry, the vectors are orthogonal. See, I'm getting ahead of myself. And so I'd really like to figure out some sort of test uh, like this dot product to figure out whether two functions are orthogonal. And this will also be sort of our definition of what it means for two functions to be orthogonal. So say I've got two different functions, uh, sine of x and sine of 2x, for example. And I want to know if these two functions are orthogonal. Well, the easiest way in my mind to do this is we can use our understanding of vectors uh, to try and define orthogonality for functions. So if we graph sine of x and sine of 2x, uh, we know sine of x is going to look something like this. Let's just draw it over a single period. So uh, let's say that this is x equals 0 is going to be x equals pi and 2 pi. And if we draw sine of 2x, we know that in the same, uh, same distance, uh, x goes from 0 to 2 pi, we're going to have two periods now instead of just one. So this is going to be uh, 2 pi, or x is equal to 2 pi. So this is our x-axis. Uh, 0, this is going to be pi over 2. Uh, this is going to be pi, and this is going to be 3 pi over 2. And both of these functions go from 1 to minus 1. So they're just your garden variety sine waves. Uh, we deal with them all the time, especially in electrical engineering. So let's just redraw sine of, this is sine of x, and this is sine of 2x. And so how do we think of these functions? Like, how would we define a dot product between these two functions? You might say, Jordan, that idea is ridiculous. Dot products only, uh, only exist for vectors. But just bear with me for a minute. Um, could we represent uh, these functions, so this function sine of x, this function sine of 2x, could we represent these as vectors? Uh, 
Um, and we we might just say, well, yeah, let's let's just try it out, uh, just for fun. Um, let's instead of taking the whole function, let's just take the function every uh, pi over eight, for example. So let's take uh, let's take like eight values of this function from zero to pi, and then eight more from zero to two pi. Uh, and we, you know, that's that's a vector, right? So uh, we're just taking the function's values and putting them in a table or a, a one dimensional table. So for the value of x is equal to zero, that corresponds to sine of x being equal to zero, or the first column or the first row in the vector being zero. Uh, if we had pi over eight, that would be uh, what I am staring at a table right now, uh, 0.38. Uh, similarly, two pi over eight, we'd have the value 0 0.71. Uh, that's just pi over four. Three pi over eight, we'd have the value uh, 0.92, uh, 4 pi over 8 or pi over 2, we just have the value of 1. And you might imagine we can continue doing this on and on and on, and we can form a, a vector of this function. So we can just tabulate its values. And you might say, well, Jordan, why'd you choose values of pi over 8? Clearly that's, that's extremely arbitrary. Um, and yeah, you're, you're totally right. Uh, I could have chosen pi over five or pi over 10, but really if it's a function, uh, we don't want to choose points from this function. We want all values of this function. So ideally we'd like these entries in our vector to be super, super, uh, finely spaced. So maybe Delta X is, uh, we want this to approach zero. We want this to be as close to zero as possible, but for representing the function as a vector, this is sort of the general idea. We're taking points of this function, so zero, pi over eight, two pi over eight, so on, so on, and just representing them as a vector. And we can do exactly the same thing for sine of two x. So we can calculate its value for x is equal to zero, that's also zero. Uh, for pi over eight, that's 0.71. Uh, for two pi over eight, that's just one. Uh, three pi over eight, that's point uh yeah a point seven one again and then four pi over eight or pi over two that's just zero and so we've got a vector uh this is a vector for sine of two x and we've got a vector for sine of x and so you might imagine we could just take the dot product of these two vectors so we just do pointwise multiplication of all the values and then we add them up so zero times zero plus 0.38 times 0.71 and so on and so on. And if you do this for a full period uh, of sine of X or sine of two X for that matter, you'll get that this sum is actually equal to zero. And that's really interesting and kind of suggestive uh, because this is how we're going to define uh, the dot product or as it's often called the inner product between two functions. We just take the values at each point uh, of the two functions and multiply them by each other and then take a sum over all the values. Or if we want these values to be even more finely spaced, so instead of pi over eight, maybe we want, uh, I don't know, pi over 16 or pi over 32, or maybe we want them infinitely spaced, so we want the distance between these two to approach zero, um, then this sum will just start to look a whole lot like an integral. And so we're going to be taking the integral of these two functions with respect to x. And in our case, it was from uh, 0 to 2 pi, for example. But you might imagine going from any value to any other value. And if this integral is equal to 0, uh, then these two functions are said to be orthogonal. So if we've got any two functions and any region, so let's call it f1 of x and f2 of x, and some region from a to b, uh, if their integral over that region is equal to zero, then f1 and f2 are orthogonal. And the way that we test for orthogonality is we take the two functions dot product, uh, or you can think of it as uh, an infinite vector, so an infinite dimensional vector multiplied pointwise multiplied by another infinite dimensional vector, and then the values are summed up, and that's just an integral. 
So if this dot product is equal to zero, then the two functions are orthogonal. Now, where this becomes really useful, uh, so where this becomes really useful, is if we know ahead of time the functions are orthogonal. So we can use some theorems or some tricks uh, to figure out that two functions are orthogonal. Then we know that their integral over that region uh, is equal to zero. And this might not seem to be super useful at first, but uh, this property will actually allow us to deal much more easily with the Schrodinger equation, because often uh, we don't want to deal with f1 and f2 directly. Um, we'd like to set as many things equal to zero as possible before even starting any computation. And this property, function orthogonality, is what's going to allow us to do that. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a like and subscribe to my channel. If you're feeling particularly generous, uh, you can always donate to my Patreon page. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them down below. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.